Hello everybody and welcome to this Key Stage 3 science video. We're going to be looking at physics today and I'm going to do a question walkthrough of some light and sound questions. And what you can do if you've not seen the questions before is of course pause the video and have a go at them and then listen to my modelling of the answers. So what I intend to do is I will write anything that is kind of a thought or an idea in blue. I will do some highlighting of key information in yellow and I will write the actual answers that gain you the marks in green. This first question is about sound and it's specifically about soundproofing. And so what they're doing is an experiment where they've got a bell inside a box and the box is made of different materials and there is a sound sensor on the outside to measure the volume of sound that is being collected. And so we have a table of data where we've got material on the first column and we've got the sound level in decibels on the next column. And then there is a bar chart below for the different materials. And you will notice that the material as being the first column that goes onto the x-axis and then the sound level in decibels, because that's the second column, that goes onto the y-axis. And remember, y goes to the sky, and the x is a cross, and that's the uh, direction that the x-axis goes. And so the first question says you need to draw the bar for material A. Now, material A has got a decibel level of 40, which is nice and easy. We can see 40 on the graph and there is no particular complexity to the scale and we just need to make sure that we follow that line along and plot the bar like so. And then the follow-up question says, how many materials did John test? And then this is just the, uh, the case of just counting them up. There are four materials, A, B, C and D. And then there are two follow-up questions. Which material was best at stopping the sound go through? And I've recreated the table down at the bottom. And so if we have a look, the sound level was lowest for D. And that's because D was insulating the sound the greatest. It was dampening the sound down. And so the answer is simply D because the sound was quietest for D. So the decibel scale means the louder the volume, the higher the decibels will be. Which two things should John have done to make his experiment a fair test? Use the same box each time. Yes, so the box contained the insulating material, so he should have used the same box each time and then the same insulating material around the bell. And so make sure a different person recorded the volume each time. No, that's not relevant. Use the same material each time. I mean, that's literally what they are changing. Keep the distance between the sensor and the bell the same. That is very sensible because if that was the, um, the bell inside the box and then the sensor was in this position here, if we then move the sensor further away, that means that the volume level will be slightly lower because as you move away from an object that is making noise, the volume that you hear gets quieter. And so we need to make sure that we keep the same distance between the sound sensor and the bell each time. Testing each material in a different room, that doesn't make any sense because some rooms might have louder background noise than others, so definitely not that. This next question is about light. And somebody is doing an experiment, shining a ray of light on a mirror and this is the light that is being shone on the mirror. It's called the incident ray, and the angle of the light coming in is referred to as the angle of incidence, and then the light is bouncing off the mirror, and this is called reflection, of course. We wouldn't call it bouncing, really. That's to help us understand it. And then the reflected ray is pointing away. Do notice that the arrows are on there, pointing in the direction that the light is moving. And then we've also got marked on the angle of reflection, the angle that the light is moving away from the mirror at. And then we also have got a line that is a dashed line that's not mentioned as a name, but it's called the normal line. So he's measuring this angle of reflection each time for different angles of incidence. And then we've got our table with the angle of 
incidence along the top and the angle of reflection along the bottom and we've been asked which one is not measured correctly and what you'll notice is that it's 30 30 40 40 50 50 60 65 and 70 70 and so the answer for which one is not correct is 65 for the angle of reflection you'll notice it's not which angle of incidence is not correct it's which angle of reflection and then the answer for why it's not correct is quite simply it should be the same angle as the angle of incidence or you can say that all the others are the same or you can say that they are not the same and then this same student goes on to do another experiment with light this time he is shining the light the incident ray is shining on a glass block and its path is changing so you notice that it's moving into the block it hits the block and then it bends slightly. And this angle, this dashed line, the normal is quite useful because we can talk about the light bending towards the normal. And it says that he's measuring the angle of refraction for different angles of incidence. And the results are on the next page. And so here is his graph that he's drawn for his results. He's got the different angles that the light goes in at along the x-axis and the different angles of refraction are on the y-axis because the bending of light when it moves from one substance to another is called refraction. And so we're using the graph to answer the questions below. When the angle of refraction is 20 degrees, what is the angle of incidence? And so we need to find 20 for the angle of refraction. So here it is. And then we need to use our graph. We need to read along to find the line. And then we need to move from that line down to the X axis. And so it meets around about here. Now, I'm not using a ruler for drawing on my screen, but you should definitely use a ruler for finding your place on the graph and then on the x-axis. And so each of these little squares is worth two degrees. And so here, this will be 30, and then halfway towards the next little square will be 31. So I am going to put my answer as 31 degrees, but depending on how you've drawn your line from the curve down to the x-axis, you could be getting anything between 30 and 32 as your correct answer. Then it follows up and says, what conclusion can James draw from his graph? And it's given you a sentence to complete. When the light passes from air into glass, the angle of incidence is always something, the angle of refraction. And the answer is it is always greater than the angle of refraction when it moves from air into glass. And then the final part of the question says, draw a line on the diagram to continue the refracted ray as it leaves the glass. And so there is a rule that when something moves from one medium, one type of substance to another, the light is going to slow down or speed up and it's going to bend or refract as a result of it. Now, since when it entered the glass, it bent towards the normal, what's going to happen when it leaves the glass is it's going to bend away from the normal. There's a dashed normal there. And it's going to bend the other direction. Now it's going to bend that way. And so what we'll end up with is, with a ruler, a line that is pretty much, hopefully, parallel to the original line that was drawn over before we went into the glass block. And so that's sort of the rule. Now you don't have to have drawn it as being absolutely parallel, although that's what it should be. But the key thing is that it needs to be away from the normal. This is the angle of refraction. That needs to be bigger than the angle that it went in at. And the angle of incidence is this angle here and it needs to be approximately in line with the original arrow. This next question is sticking with the idea of reflection and refraction, and there is a snail and a fish in a tank. There is a plant between them, but the question is declaring that the fish can see the snail in the surface of the water because the surface of the water is acting like a mirror. And so what we need to have to show the light and its path is the, we can see the snail because light is hitting it and then light is being reflected off it. And so the light that is reflected off the snail will move up to the surface of the water that's acting as a mirror and then it will reflect off the surface of the water down to the fish and the fish can see it. 
And so in terms of getting the marks here, you need to make sure all your lines are straight. You need to make sure that the angle of incidence, that's this one, is about the same as the angle of reflection, which is that one. And then you need to make sure that you have drawn your arrow heads pointing in the correct direction. So there's a tick for arrow heads, a tick for the angle of incidence being equal to the angle of reflection, and a tick for the lines being straight. And then we've got Andrew is looking at the snail and we want to draw a ray of light from the snail to Andrew to show how Andrew can see the snail. And again, they're telling us to use a ruler. Now, what you can't do is just that, because if that was the answer, that doesn't acknowledge the fact that we've got air and we've got water between Andrew and the snail. And so the light that is moving from the snail is going to change direction when it leaves the water. And so what we have to do, and, th and this is not kind of precise, but what we need to have is a straight line from the snail to the surface of the water, something like this. And then where we've got our sort of normal in the, uh, at the meeting between the air and the water, the light needs to bend away from the normal towards Andrew's eye. And you can see, just like we had with the glass block before, the angle of incidence is smaller than the angle of refraction. And so again, we need to have the arrowheads as well. There's only two marks this time, but we need to have that change of direction here, and we need to have the arrow head pointing towards Andrew. So if you had drawn the original line, you, you might have got away with one mark, but we need to make sure that you're getting the two marks. And we've been saying this quite a bit. The actual answer to this one is in fact refraction. That is the name of the process of the bending of light, the changing of direction of light when it moves from one substance to another. This next question is still about light, but now it's about colours of light. And so we've got two balls, a white ball and a green ball, and the light is shone through a red filter onto the white ball and the white ball appears red. Now we'd expect a white ball to appear white and remember white light is all of the colours combined but red filters only let light pass through that is red. They absorb all the other colours and so that's the first mark that we need to say here. Only red light has passed through the filter and so when the red light hits the white ball since white objects reflect all the light, this will reflect off the white ball to somebody's eye and they will detect this as being a red object because that is the only colour of light that their eye is receiving. And so for the second mark, we need to say the ball reflects the red light. The next part of the question is about a second experiment where white light is again shone onto a red filter so only red light can pass through. This time though the object that is being hit by the red light is a green object. Now green objects only reflect green light. Since red light is hitting it no light is passing out or moving from that green ball. So the colour that this appears is black. And so the answers that you have to give for the explanation is you could say the green ball does not reflect red light or it does not reflect the light that, passes, that has passed through the filter. Or you could say that the green object absorbs all the red light. The final part of this question is Peter doing a third experiment where he's cut three holes into a piece of card. The first hole he has covered with a red filter, remember that only lets red light through, then he's got a green filter that only lets green light through, and then he's got clear which will let all the colours through. He is then shining the light onto this object with the three holes, and then he's placing a red filter between this card and a white screen, and he's shining white light onto the initial piece of card. So we've got white light shining on each of these holes. Now the first hole has a red filter, so only red light can pass through that little red filter. Only green light can pass through the green filter and all the colors can pass through the clear space. And then when we hit the red filter, red filters only let red light through. So red light will pass through here. 
the green light will be absorbed, so nothing further will pass through there, and then white light, the only component of the white light that can pass through is red, and so what we'll actually see is we'll see two red spots. And that's what you need to say for your answer. You don't have to draw them in position, but there will be two red spots, although we would accept red, black, red. This final question is about sound, and it's about some students trying to investigate the speed of sound. And we've got three pupils, Sylvia, Paul and James, they're standing the same distance away from an explosion. Sylvia is wearing a blindfold, which blocks out light, of course. Paul is wearing ear defenders, which block out sound. And James is wearing a blindfold and ear defenders, which, of course, blocks out both. And so he has got a stick that is pressed onto the floor and he's trying to feel the vibrations through the stick that have come through the ground. And the explosion produces sound and light at the same time. And then we've got some supporting numbers that tell us what the speed of sound is in air. It's 340 metres per second. And then through the soil, it's 3,200 metres per second. So a larger number through the soil. And so the question says, use all the information above to help you answer the question. In which order would the pupils notice the explosion? So first of all, the person who would notice it first would be the person who is looking at it. And so Paul would be the person that would notice it first. And that's because light travels faster than sound. And then the next person to notice it would be James. And then the last person to notice it would be Sylvia. And the reason that James would notice it first is that, as we've just said, James is detecting the vibrations through the soil and Sylvia is relying on vibrations in the air. And it's approximately 10 times faster vibrating through the soil. And then from the information given, calculate the time it would take for the sound to travel through the air to Sylvia. Now, we know that speed is equal to distance over time. That's a calculation you need to remember. And so therefore, time is distance divided by speed. And the distance we were shown up in the diagram is 1,020 meters. And the speed of sound through the air, which is how Sylvia is detecting this, is 340 meters per second. And so when we divide that number by 340, we get an answer of three seconds. That's how long it would take for the sound to travel through the air to Sylvia. And we have a follow-up question here where there is another student called Nasa and she is standing 2,000 metres away from the explosion. And the sound heard by Nasa was quieter than the sound heard by Sylvia and the statement that we've got to support that is the further sound travels the quieter it becomes. And the reason for this is the energy is more spread out once it's traveled a longer distance. Or you could say some of the sound is absorbed by the air, or you could give a really technical answer and say that the amplitude of the sound has decreased. And then the very last bit of this question shows an oscilloscope trace that is representing the sound that Sylvia heard. Now, an oscilloscope is a way of visualizing the sound, and you can see we've got what is a typical pattern of going down, then up to a peak, then down, and then up to a peak again, repeating like that. And so the sound that Nasa has heard was quieter, but the pitch was the same. And so on the right hand grid, we have to show the pattern of the sound. And so it's quieter. And what that means is the amplitude, which is the up and down, that needs to be lower. So whatever you draw, it has to be a lower amplitude. And we always have got um, a middle position here. And so if we consider the first one, there was the middle, there's a middle position for this one. And so our peaks need to be lower for Nasa's sound. But we've also got the pitch being the same. And the pitch is how spread out the sound is. So this is a really high pitch sound. And then this one would be a lower pitch sound that was a lot more spread out. And a loud sound would be a really big peaks like this. And then a soft sound would be lower peaks like that. And so Nasa's peaks need to be in the same position as they are on the original for Sylvia. 
but they need to be lower. So I've decided that that's where my peaks and my troughs are going to be. So I'm going to go up and down like that. And so that is just to annotate it. It's quieter because the peaks have been sort of squashed downwards, but it's the same frequency because the gap between my peaks or the gap between my troughs is the same for Nasa as it is for Sylvia. It's just Nasa's peak has been squashed downwards back towards the middle. Okay, that's the end of this video. We'll be back again soon. See you then.